This is the Brad House Sports Show. And now for this week's completely different and humorous perspective on everything sports, here's Brad House Mike and Sidekick. Well, look at there. You found us again. It's hard to believe it's already been a week. Yep, but we're back at it right here from the frat house. Frat house, too. Got Mark right there. We're switching it up a little bit. We got Psychic over here coming to us via Skype. Uh, You know, I keep thinking, I keep thinking, well, you know, here we are, are, what, uh, almost mid-June, summertime. At some point or another, we're going to work our way into a sports lull. No lull. Absolutely no lull. Are you kidding me? Here's what we got on track for tonight. How about NCAA? We got a little NBA. We got some World Cup. Yeah. We've got NHL. We got Major League Baseball. We got NASCAR. We got MMA chat. Yeah. All of that in the middle or at the beginning of summer or the middle of June. Who'd have thunk it, huh? Gentlemen, we used to always sit around going, oh my gosh, what are we going to talk about after football? (laughs) All right. What do you say we kick it off with our big stories? We're going to jump right into it with a little NCAA chat. Uh, It took five years uh, to get here, but uh, one of the numerous lawsuits uh, targeted at the NCAA got underway on Monday uh, with the often talked about Ed O'Bannon versus NCAA. Now, it's expected that this case will probably only take about three weeks as it's being heard not by a jury trial, but by only one determining judge. In fact, I kind of think that the highlight most likely will be when, in fact, NCAA President Mark Emmert will, in fact, testify himself. That I'm looking forward to. That I would like to see, like they broadcast Judge Judy. Um, The former NBA pro, though, O'Bannon, Uh, One of the things you got to understand about this particular case, he is not currently seeking any kind of monetary settlement from the uh, NCAA, but moreover is attempting to coerce the NCAA to modify its rules, allowing current and former uh, student athletes to seek endorsements or to accept endorsements and generate income from autograph signings, appearances, commercials, trading cards, all those types of things that a professional would with a free agent or with an agent would be able to uh, be able to do that without any kind of sanctions from the governing body. Now, uh, the NCAA has consistently contended uh, that that would undermine the whole spirit of quote-unquote amateurism. Uh, This is being heralded as a landmark case and one is actually, in my opinion, it's actually more important really for the NCAA than for the student quote-unquote amateur athletes. Uh, as there are right now multiple lawsuits, all in different stages. This one has reached court. Others are working their way up to that point. One is actually seeking outright compensation for student athletes. Mm -hmm. Another that we already know is ongoing and probably will be heard shortly is the one regarding the Northwestern uh, team, uh, football team, that is in fact has voted to unionize. That's got to come up before the National Labor Relations Board. You can bet that's going to be taken to a court thereafter. However, that case gets decided by the NLRB. Uh, But there are multiple cases that are ongoing. This case is more important for the NCAA to come out looking well. If the NCAA wins the ruling in the O'Bannon case, what they would be able to do potentially would be able to use the decision in this case as a precedent in some of those other ones that will be forthcoming later on. If O'Bannon, however, wins, it's not going to change a whole heck of a lot with the exception of probably just a mere handful, a small minority of super hyped student athletes, Manziel types, who would be able to benefit from this type of thing that, in fact, O'Bannon is calling for. So, in fact, it's not going to have that great of an effect. It will change the way the NCAA looks at these types of things, but it's only going to benefit really a handful, potentially, of of student athletes who would be the ones that would really be talked about and hyped through Division I programs. Now, I'm going to reveal here, and I think I probably have done so on other programs, 
I'm not in favor of students receiving any type of compensation. And in fact, I'm going to be honest with you, I'm copacetic with the way it is right now. But I'm okay with, the, you know, just let the, the, the way it's currently everything's transacted go. I'm good with it. But I will also admit that I, I, am, I am absolutely fascinated by the machinations of everything that is going on and what has transpired to have led us up to this particular point. Uh, in my opinion, absolutely very, very little doubt in my mind that when all of the dust, dust settles on this, and gentlemen, I think it could be years and years away before we ever see that occur, the NCAA is going to look very, very different if it exists at all from the way it does right now. This case is the beginning of it all, and this one is one we have talked about right here on this show over the past couple of years. So I throw it open. Where are we coming down on this one? Uh, and thoughts on it? Sidekick? Well, uh, you know, I, I do kind of agree with you. Uh on, on some of your points. I agree with the NCAA, NCAA about student athletes. These are student athletes. They should not be compensated. You know, um, the system's not broke. I don't think we should, you know, be fixing that piece of it. But where I do disagree with the NCAA is, I, or where I think things got screwed up, is the greed of the NCAA. Thank you. And the fact, you know, you've got a nonprofit organization yep. who's sitting here making money hand over fist yep. over all the all the TV rights, all of this stuff. They screwed themselves up. Ultimately, they'll be the blame for why we no longer have student athletes and we now have paid college athletes. I couldn't so. agree with you more. In fact, I really believe this is a perfect case of pride coming before the fall. If the if this goes the if this goes against the NCAA, they've got nobody to blame but themselves. What do you think? Well, you know it's interesting because I, we we're going to see it touched on, although maybe not particularly here, because O'Banion is is claiming that it's not germane. But Title IX issues are going to come into play here. There's no I doubt mean, about there's it. No two ways around it because should let's say O'Banion's case come out and be found for by uh, the judge in this case. What it would essentially mean is that men will receive compensation. Women could too. But in this case, the, the, the argument is that men will receive compensation not directly from the school and probably not until they graduate. Correct. So therefore, it really doesn't impact Title IX. But that's a whole lot of who shot John. Because absolutely, Title IX from 1972 when it was when it was brought into now, play correct. Uh, basically is to forbid discrimination based on gender bias correct and there are a lot of women out there uh, in hoops programs that are going to be I don't believe looking though, to get their yeah, but I don't believe ball. though that the O'Bannon case <clears throat> would preclude those as I just talked about those hyped high profile ladies right, right. from being able to get an endorsement it's not going to prevent them they would be just as eligible would they be as attractive, pardon the pun, um, to endorsers as much as, say, a Division I guy right. who's going to get drafted into the NFL? Maybe not necessarily, so there, you know, there's not going to be as much going for them. But that wouldn't come back on the school because the school is not going to be looking at it as necessarily saying, well, that's not our problem. That's, 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 that's what the market will bear. Right. I think where Title IX is going to come into more of a play is with the Northwestern issue. When we start getting into those kinds of cases, or when we get into the case, uh, into the, I believe it's the Kearns case, where in fact, right. yeah. where in fact, Arizona State quarterback. Correct. Yeah. Where right. in fact they're actually looking for full-blown compensation. compensation. They want for, money. For yeah. students. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're going to have Title right. IX issues. Right. And, and, and there's no doubt about it. Right. You know, what's going to happen then to some of these smaller schools, smaller division, one schools even, when you get into those kinds of things, right. and women are not getting the whole high-profile programs like football and basketball. What's going to happen then? Well, the other thing, the abandon thing, that kind of opens the door to is the possibility that students could then have agents that represent them. That being said, it's naturally going to go over into uh, the cross-gender. Because you're right, you're not going to have that high profile, that many uh, female students, but agents will help to represent them 
to make the most cost productive and revenue generating compensation and then for in them. In some respects, that so. leads to the whole other question because if unions are allowed by virtue of the Northwestern thing, how well, do now, you, how do agents we close, fix it? In, well, in exactly that? right. So exactly this is right. opening up. This is what I'm saying. Right. This whole situation is just so darn oh, angry to me of worms. from the it's standpoint of, of machinations right. of it all. Uh, so I can jump in if you can make any sense of any of this because we've kind of dominated the, oh, no. the yeah. nonsense. I, I, yeah, I, exactly. I said my piece, you know. I mean, but you're exactly you're. This thing's going to open up so many different, you know, iterations of what you know what we can have with you know women in sports and unions and yep. compensation and agents. And you know, once we get, get agents, into benefits, once we get into right. agents in college, oh my God, yeah. You know, I mean, look. Imagine Drew Ro- Rosenhaus, agent for college kids. Oh, hell with that. Frat House Sports I, is yeah. going to go be an agent. Are you well, kidding that, you That's know, what we're going to do. We're going to go jump in and be uh, agents. Might be our next then, calling uh, right there. Like, okay. Imagine, I imagine Johnny Barry. Football is a Drew Rosenhaus client. Could you imagine... What would be go- what would have been going on at Texan a- Texas A and M with him? Yeah, but wouldn't it be awesome to hear that there's some female soccer player out there who wants to play for the World Cup in like four or eight years? That's a Fred House Sports, uh, uh, you know, that's right. being represented by we're, Fred House Sports. I love sponsoring. that concept. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. On a side note, you know, they're talking about if 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 this thing opens the door. This being the first in many cases, if the O'Bannon thing comes down on his side. Uh, you know, that means there's going to be some kind of negotiable compensation for uh, uh, student athletes. How is that going to, or will it not, impact these crazy coaching salaries that seem to just dominate uh, not all not all programs, but certainly, you know, Nick Saban comes to mind oh, yeah. as, as a multimillionaire every year. I mean... Where's the money coming from? Yeah. You're, you know, yeah, is, there guy, gonna be, is there going to be well, some pullback okay, from, yeah, my guy, from Coach that? K. Well, in fact, well, some of the analysis on this has been this, that the O'Bannon case will not have any impact whatsoever on that because, in fact, any revenue that student athletes would be receiving would be coming from outside sources. So, in fact, what it, all it's doing is it's just circumventing the NCAA. So the NCAA is not getting that money from licensing and things like that. It will not affect the individual schools, bottom line, because their revenue will still continue to be the same. With the exception of any kind of cutback, donation, right. stipend, whatever, that right. they would get from the NCAA exactly. as a result of a trickle-down from the licensing. All right, I got so, you. So uh, there, there's actually belief that, no, there will probably be no impact on, on what you're talking about with those, will with those ath- salaries. Will athletic departments have to pay and pick up the difference then. In other words, will you see a shrinking of athletic departments so that we we're can maintain the Coach K uh, salary yeah, in that? We're seeing it already, and the bottom line is there's probably, as I pointed out before, there are probably only 10, 10 entire athletic programs in the entire country that actually make money. All others either break even or the vast majority are losing money, and that's even in Division One schools. Wow, okay. Right, but here, here's, an, here's a question for you, Mike. Could we potentially see, though, this becoming a uh, sponsors being a bargaining chip as part of the recruiting process now? Could universities say, hey, you know, oh, we've wow. got deals with Nike, with Gatorade or whatever, and then try to start manipulating their relationships with these sponsors to say, hey, if you come to Texas A&M, We'll get you a sponsorship through Gatorade. Wow. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, or or did so, or does know, that or does that become a foul? That sounds like an NCAA violation inside the NCAA to be honest. Yeah, it almost does. <laughs> that, it'll be interesting to see if that's oh boy. How, how soon that question comes wow. up. Because I think that's a legitimate question. Well, now wow. just, you know, that's just off, literally. Well, off, no, off you make of a good head. point. Yeah, I, you know, but I'm that's a of, very yeah, but that's a good uh, meeting meeting mean question. To, I don't mean to, to isolate one particular one, but I'm thinking of uh, uh, our Louisville Cardinals down there. Who are, who are highly sponsored by the uh, restaurant company, uh, uh, it'll come to me in a second, uh, that owns many of the fast food chains. And I could see Louisville saying to their recruits, primary, you know, so-and-so is a, is, yeah, is a big sponsor, sponsor of is, ours. Right. Uh, uh-huh. that starts Are you to trying get really to give me the double talk? 
I mean, uh, you know, it could still fall under the whole that that you know recruiting violations, you know that we that are yeah, kind of currently in place. But if you you know if you open up this Pandora's box and say, well, hey, thing. you can you well, can now you can have sponsorship deals as a, as an individual player now. Does that get involved in the conversation? All well, I think you're bringing up. I think you're bringing up one of the things that the NCAA doesn't want to have to address, and that is that by doing this, they're actually going to have to look at themselves and probably address their own internal right. operations. And sure. now, what you're going to have to have is you're going to have to have bylaws committees coming in and rewriting the way that they operate. Which might be the that might ultimately be what O'Bannon wants to have happen, right? He's looking for rule changes. Well that's not compensation, here, yeah. but rule changes of the amateurism status. He Correct. wants that to be changed or otherwise uh, what Whoa, you know boy. modified. Right, modified. Yeah. Man, we could do a whole oh, round dude, we, table I know. We for could keep two going and a half this. hours it's if we fascinating wanted to on stuff, this. Though. It, it really, really is. is. I mean, you know, all the people might be sitting there, their eyes might be glassing over mm-hmm. with all of this, but I've got to tell you, th- I agree with them that there is probably no bigger case right now that's coming down sports and the way it's going to affect things into the future. I think some of the other cases coming down after the fact are going to be bigger, but this one is big for NCAA. They have got to win this one, and I understand why. I would agree. Yeah, I, I would agree. I understand why. All right, let's move on to uh, our next story, and that. Well, we're, we're back at it again. Can you believe this? And, and, and look, here, here's where I am with it. Uh, allow me to send a message to Donald Sterling. Mr. Sterling, from all of us here at Frat House Sports, you now bore us. Okay? We're done with you. All right? This thing is over. It, we thought it was over last week. We announced right here that it had died down and that it was all done. And what do you do? You go and change your mind. Are you kidding me? All right. Suddenly now he has he has decided that what he's going to do is no, he is not no. going to go along yeah, right. with the two billion dollars sale no, to not. Steve Bomber. No, I was. And uh, he, exactly. No, I'm not. Yeah. Wait, 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 didn't we see a, a, a takeoff on this? On yeah. what was it? Was it on Kimmel? I was. And, uh, uh, there, the, it, it, I'm not. And, and he's reinstituting or moving ahead with the $1 billion lawsuit against the NBA. And, Mrs. Sterling, you must understand that with each mo- movement and action and every time you speak, whether it's you or an attorney, you are doing nothing more than making yourself look exactly as your wife contended. You are mentally That's unstable. <laughs> I got one for him. You are a meat. Go ahead. Dead hey, from the neck meat. up. <laughs> yeah, dead from the neck up. All right. Absolutely. Now, apparently, the situation is supposed to be decided in a three to five day hearing that will take place on July 5, Sterling versus Sterling. Right, right, and right. And this apparently is supposed to be the beginning, or let's hope it's the end at that point. By, by suing his own wife, what he is doing, or at least putting a, some sort of an injunction in against his wife, he is attempting to stop the sale right. of the Clippers. And that's what Sterling versus Sterling, which, and the judge apparently has allowed three to five days to hear it. That's it. That's all she's going to allow. I think it's a woman that's going to be hearing this one. I forget who exactly what, who the judge is. But July 5 apparently is the date, unless some reasonable individual uh, who can talk a madman yeah, into off doing a cliff. something. Yeah, thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah. We're done with this story. We're not bringing it up anymore. We don't want to bring it up on our big stories. We're done. Apparently, it, apparently it takes a hot Asian American to make him see straight. No. <clears throat> Just saying. Just, okay. just saying. Um, uh, and he's effectively suing himself at this point because of the agreement that's in place with Balmer by Shelly, his wife. She played a hell of a shell game, by the way. I mean, she was pro- agreed. We appropriately about, named sure. Shelly. Uh, but... Uh, the, the NBA is completely indemnified from any any damages by Sterling as a result of this lawsuit. So he's effectively suing himself and creating a delay for its own purpose. Not almost. completely indemnified. 
see, th that would be the next step. Sterling versus Sterling is the first step, and then, then we're going right. to have the lawsuit. Well, I know, and that's the so, thing. And silver, it, you know, boy, Sterling, hey, silver, it's all tarnished. I'm I don't get tell it. You, we really <laughs> needed to have an attorney on the line this evening with us oh, so far for God. all Yeah, there's all been a lot I, of uh, minutiae here. We, I think we've seen this before. It was the Brown Dustin Brown Hoffman Brown film, and Kramer versus Kramer. Boy, oh, boy, you know it. Well, yeah, kind of. Wow. This is a little, yeah. All right. All right, anyhow, Donald Sterling, we're done with you, hopefully. But oh we do not God. want you on Please the big story. Yeah, well, food yeah. Food. would you? All right, uh, let's move on. We have a big story brewing right as we speak right now. Uh, it seems that there's been, uh, at least to me, it seems that there's been more hype uh, to this year's commencement of the World Cup uh, of soccer than I remember in previous years that it's been held. Uh, beginning today um, with the match between Brazil versus Croatia, which I believe Sidekick filled me in. I think uh, Brazil held off and won that one 3-1 against Croatia. Is that right? Yes, they did. All right. Well, with that one, we will now be living with the World Cup for the next four weeks. That is until the finals on July 13. So if you haven't gotten your fill of World Cup, well, get ready. Buckle your seatbelt. You're going to get a lot of it in the next four. Um, and with that, I want to bring in our soccer expert, Sidekick. Who are some of the favorites in this thing? Well, uh, for those that don't know, uh, basically we've got the World Cup. It goes on for a month. Um, and what we do, it's kind of like March Madness in some respects. Boy, uh, oh, really? well, I guess I might <laughs> This ought to be good, then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we were worried about. There's a bracket? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bracket buster now. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. Get the brackets going. Go ahead. So we, we've got, uh, basically, we've got eight groups of four that play in group play. Uh, that start... Uh, obviously started today and goes through the 26th. Uh, basically, every team plays uh, every team in their group. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Group A. The the big dogs in this one looking to go move on will be Brazil and Croatia, who actually play today. Um, with Brazil being actually the heavy favorite to possibly win the whole the whole World Cup. Uh, group B, we see uh, Spain. Uh, co probably coming out of there as well as Chile. Um, group C, we have uh, Colombia and Japan, most likely out of that group of four. Um, group D, we have Uruguay okay. and uh, what? Italy, probably. What's oh, no. that? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm a what? Wait, Uruguay. Uruguay. No, yeah, I'm a guy. What do you say? You're a guy. <laughs> what do you say? Um, then Group B, we have Ecuador and France. Uh, most likely advancing out of that. Uh, group F, here we go, on and on and on. Uh, Argentina and uh, Nigeria advancing from that group. And then Grupo de Morte, which is the death group, and this is the group I really, this, this group's loaded. In Group G, we have Germany, who's looking, who probably will advance. Right. We have Portugal, who will probably advance. Uh, Ghana, and then the U.S., these are four of the strongest teams in the whole tournament. So it's kind of like what we saw in, uh, to bring it, you know, into Mark's terms, in the NHL where we saw, you know, the, uh, the Blues and the Blackhawks early on, mm -hmm. two big heavy-hitting teams that, you know, have no chance to really advance that far because they're going to, you know, one of them Square is up. knocking the other one out right, early right. in. So uh, that's a really tough group. And it sucks for me because I want, you know, because I root for both the U.S. and Germany. And when I saw the draws, I, you know, it kind of had that sinking feeling because I knew I wasn't going to get both teams out of that group. All right, hold um, on. Now let me, let me back up the bus here a moment. Okay. Because, uh, you know, when you're talking about the U.S., yes. uh, you are talking about the men's team, right, not the women's team? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. I just want to make sure we were right about that. Because, uh, wait a minute, this is the men's team where the coach himself, uh, Jurgen Klinsmann, actually came out and said, uh, uh, you know, for the U.S. to win, uh, quote, unquote, it's just not realistic. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Ringing. And well, unfortunately. Hello? I mean, everybody I have, uh, I have heard and talked to says the U.S. doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning anything in World Cup. For maybe anywhere between eight and twenty years. <laughs> well, you have to. One thing you have to remember is these are like the Olympics. It's every four years. Sure. So okay, and it's a team in flux right now, and that's the problem. You know, we we had our shot at winning, 
and we did really well and now we're kind of you know it's kind of waning and we're trying to you know trying to regroup here sidekick let's get real the americans are not a world cup soccer team i mean seriously it, it is all south american and epl teams that's where they come from with the United oh, yeah. States, the United States is not a soccer is not a soccer state is not a soccer country. We never have been, and frankly, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think we ever will be. That's well, my personal opinion. Well, okay, but now if we look at that though, here here's some numbers for you. The MLS last year, their average attendance was over eighteen thousand. That's more than M most. Some NBA and some NHL teams. Yeah, more than some hockey, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, so, and if you talk to EPL f followers, they will tell you that what the MLS is producing right now would be tantamount to a single A baseball team. Come on, that's what we're producing over here is Major League Soccer. That sure. in in the world on the world scope of soccer, our our MLS teams Strictly are nothing. Strictly amateur. Nothing. Absolutely mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. Right, and. And see, part of, here's here's where here's where the U.S. differs from the rest of the world. Okay, in the U.S., where where do your soccer where where do your soccer fan or where do your soccer players come from? There, most of them are. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be stereotypical. No. white suburban kids who are affluent. Whereas <laughs> you go everywhere else in the world, and where do the soccer players come from? They come from, you know, the poverty. The you know the troubled communities stuff like that. Okay, no, I, I, you're making a good sociological point, and I fully fully understand exactly what your what your what your point is. I'm saying that I don't think that our mentality with regard to sports in this country. You go into those same areas in this country, and we know we've got them. All we have to do is drive into sections of Philadelphia sure. around here. You've got them where you can attract kids to play soccer. They're not going to play soccer. They're playing football. Right. Soccer's not attracting them, dude. That's my point. There is no right. interest for soccer in America, period. And we can prove that. And we got the graph, all right? We can bring the graph up. There we go, all right? And you can see that Major League Soccer is all the way down at the very bottom. And this graph was just from a couple of years ago. NFL still reigns supreme in this country. 62%, for God's sake, the Olympics at 58% is bigger than Major League Baseball as far as interest in this country. Soccer all the way down at the bottom, all right? Uh, you know, men's and women's tennis gets more interest in soccer. I don't believe, and I say this with all due respect to any soccer fans that are out there, and I know that there are soccer fans, and I know that it's a sport that, that is trying that wants its recognition, that really is struggling to get some sort of its own market. I got it. This is not the country for it. I don't believe soccer is ever, I believe that it had its time. And you know when it had its time? It's had its time when the women won the World Cup. When was that, uh, Sidekick? What year was that? 90 Eight, what? Nine, 98, no. 90. Was it later? Well, 99. And, and basically that's kind of what some of the Brandy Chastain, Brandy Chastain, and Mia right. Hamm, and right, right, right. That's when they should have capitalized on it, and they started to, but it didn't. It didn't. It just couldn't get over right. the hump. Yeah, basically, they had. We had the World Cup in '94, and part of the thing with having the World Cup in the U.S. was we had to have a professional soccer league, mm -hmm. and that's where the MLS was born out of. Was out of the World Cup, and then you know, so it saw some prominence for a while. But, you know, it's kind of dropped off. So, but I don't know why. How are you, you going to get that back? That was 20 years ago. You would have thought that something would have jumped on board by this point. Right. Well, and, you know, the thing with soccer is it has to start with the youth. It has to start that order. Right, exactly. We've talked about this with other sports. Right. And that, you know, you have to start bringing up the player, you know, bringing up players and, you know, kids and getting them into soccer. So, and I, you know, I think it's kind of fiddled off a little bit. There was well, a big I, push for a while, and it, it's kind of, you know. And as you well know, I spent many years down in, in elementary education, and here is what I saw. Exactly what you're talking about. Yes, with the really, really young kids, even as young as four, five, six, seven, eight years old. Yes, soccer was the thing to do. But by the time they get to middle school, you know what? They're all peeling off. And they're going and saying, you know what? I'm playing field hockey. I'm going over here. I'm playing basketball. I'm going over here. I'm playing. Uh, I'm playing uh, a football. They all peeled off. 
they, they can't seem to sustain it in the middle school years. You can do it down at the really young ages, but after right. that, it disappears. Shall we play a game? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and Whopper weighs in. Um, anyhow, I th- that's my opinion on the whole thing as far as... Well, buckle up for four weeks more, then. I know. I, 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 and, you know, can I tell you right <laughs> You've now... You've made it compelling for me to watch. <laughs> Sidekick, let, let me ask you just your personal opinion. Yep. With the exception of that small 16%, okay, that in fact indicates on here that they're soccer fans in this country... Will anybody else in this country give a damn about the World Cup once America isn't in the uh, quarterfinals, semifinals, playoff side of situation as we go forward? Will anybody else give a damn? Well, now, see, I can't speak for, you know, a large demographic, but I can tell you that my Facebook timeline is blowing up with everybody all wanting to watch World Cup. <laughs> But that also made me a my of, in my butt. I have friends with similar interests. I was going to say, that's why you're our MLS expert and our soccer expert. Right. <laughs> that's why we keep you around here, dude. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. And uh, real quick, I just want to do, do a real quick uh, follow-up uh, uh, because we did talk about it a lot, uh, horse racing, which happens to get actually more interest, I, according to that yeah, guy, right. than, 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 than soccer. Uh, World Cup. <laughs> uh, no, unfortunately, we did not see a triple crown winner uh, last week as California Crow came in fourth, tied fourth, actually tied fourth at the uh, Belmont Stakes. Uh, Tonalist won the race. Disappointing. Well, yes, it was, um, and uh, that really, in my opinion, should be the end of the story. Uh, except NBC immediately shoved a microphone in the face of Chrome's owner Steve Coburn seconds after the loss, and uh, Coburn went on a ranting tirade about mm-hmm. how the rules should be changed, up. that all horses should have to run at least two of the three races, and essentially, really, well, I'm not he didn't say it this way, but let's get it straight. He essentially referred to Totalist and his team as a fraud ringer. I mean, let's get it straight. That's nice. basically what nice. he did. Uh, gentlemen. Says the, says the guy that puts <laughs> nasal strips on his horse. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> now, that's legal. They, breathe they, right. They it yeah, okay. it's breathe right. It was okay. It was all right. Yeah, okay, legal. The argument that I made to numerous people and to numerous uh, websites that were out there that said that they agreed with Coburn, my argument was, hey, if you're the best horse ever, of which we know there have only been 12 that have ever won the Triple Crown, if you're the best horse ever, then it shouldn't matter. You can take on all comers. So this nonsense Basically. about... You know, and if you start to make it required that certain horses, you know, only a handful of horses can appear in each, all, all of them, what's going to happen is the field is going to get smaller as you go towards the bell line. So there's going to be fewer and fewer horses because some of them are going to say, what the hell's the point? All right. Everybody knows that only one can win the Triple Crown after the Kentucky Derby. Right. What's the point? Yeah, I don't I got understand you. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think uh, Coburn is a moron. Well, person, case, case of sour grapes, probably. Come on, let's well, be honest. Sour grapes. Well, he went on a tirade for two days before he actually came out with his apology, I guess, on uh, Good Morning America, the day after he ripped them apart again on Good Morning America uh, on, on Monday. Wow. Okay. Go ahead, psychic. Jump in. I I'm, I'm, agree with you. I mean, the whole thing behind the triple crown is you have to win all three races nothing says that you have to you know that you have to participate you know you can't race in the belmont if you're not in any of the other races yeah. or you know, uh, come on he, uh, i think it's one of the reasons that there have been so few there have been so few it's a difficult thing to do in five weeks for god's sake what, are we suddenly yeah. going to make this easier? Is that what we do all the time? You know, it seems like what we yeah. do all the time with everything. We're going to just yeah. make things uh, And, you know, maybe maybe the owner of Tonalist, maybe his game was, I, I don't care about the Triple Crown. I care about winning the money. Exactly. So, you know, I want to run this race. I know right. I can probably win this race. Right. And I know I could probably win this race. Right. There so, go. I'm in it for the money. There you go. I don't care go. about the, you know, I, I'm sure there's money in Triple Crown, but... You know, he's probably thinking, I don't need a triple, you know, you don't know, well, I mean, you know, you don't know what he's thinking. No, but I agree. Motivations you know. change between yeah. them. Right. Probably the money that comes out of Triple Crown is more endorsement than anything else, although mm-hmm. I know that there is a well, separate yeah. trophy. There is a separate oh, trophy, yeah, and I think there might of, be a little extra. There's glam. There's there's a little. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Studies, yeah. 
Exactly. <clears throat> All right, there you go. Those are our big stories. We we talked a lot about them. Mm -hmm. uh, probably went over time. Well, I'm sure. they were big. All right, let's get over though to our hat trick segment. Speaking of um, stud service. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, buddy. Yeah, uh, buddy. Our, our hat trick se segment uh, really got uh, an extra week's reprieve uh, because last evening, Uncle Mark, I think both you and I were probably sitting here thinking. Oh well, tomorrow night's show. We're going to be we're announcing. We're going to be talking about who won. We're going to be announcing that yeah. the Kings are the new uh, Stanley Cup champions. Yeah, Get the not brooms so fast, though, huh? No, listen. Put the brooms away, right? And and every Rangers fan out there is saying, put the brooms away. Uh, they're no all more, over my Facebook no, page. Yeah, well, no more talk. And you know that that winning that game four of these best of seven series, that's the toughest game to win. Let's be honest. It is. And and I, hey, credit hey. to the Rangers. Credit to the Rangers. Credit to Lundqvist, forty-one. Shots Dude, on goal. It, the man was a wall. And he turned 40 of them away. Well, you know, listen, they brought physicality. The Rangers did last night, which they really had to. I mean, it was absolutely desperation. Uh, particularly uh, Strawman and Stepan, yep. both very physical, made yep. all the difference in backing up their goaltender. Uh, and again, you know, just just great movement from Zuccarello, uh, Brass, the Pouliot, that line. We've heard about these guys before, uh, you know, this round. You were sporadically hearing that that unit is really clicking, and they made a great deal of difference. And, and yeah, King Henrik last night, I mean, stood on his head, and we even when he was on his ass, the slush on the goal line backed him up. So, listen, a little bit of puck luck there for the Rangers. So, listen, uh, thanks third for Rita's. We're, we're throwing another shout out to Rita's. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, the downside was that third period was, oh, oh. I mean, it was all L.A. Yep. And 40 minutes is not going to do it. We know this. this is a Stanley Cup final. Uh, they were outshot 15 to one by LA. Okay, mm -hmm. and as you just mentioned, I mean it, the guy uh, Blunquist turned 40 shots away. Mm -hmm. Yep. How much more do you expect from the man? Well, there were only 18 shots in the entire game by the Rangers. Right. The, the Rangers themselves were... And yet they looked faster well, for two-thirds of the game than they had in the other games. And, in, and as you point out, though, it was the third period. In that third period, it almost seemed as though maybe they were fearful, maybe they were frustrated. But New York almost appeared as though they were willing to just take a win... But don't take any more chances. Put up the wall. Right. Put up the wall. And that's a very scary game. To, we know L.A. can score in bunches, and the fact that they didn't come from behind yep. and win that last night was kind of a surprise to everybody. Yep. Um, you know, we're going back to L.A. now for Game 5. I'm not going to make a prediction. We're going to just let the stats and, and the, the game play out. However, there's a few things that the Rangers really need to change from last night's especially third period, namely the power play. Okay, they were top five all year long, and it's part of the reason they got to the final. Okay, last night they went 0 for 3, so they had three opportunities that were lost. 0 for 3, you say, well, geez, that wasn't bad. But let's not forget, this time of year, the referees have finally put the whistles away. So you're really not getting that many opportunities. So when you get three opportunities to score in a power play and you've been doing it all year, you really need to do that. The other thing they've got to really look at is face-offs. In the face-off circle last night, they were terrible. They were 24 of 65 that they won. That's about a third of the time. You're not going to have horrible. puck control. And that third period demonstrated no puck control because they were not winning the draws. Yep. And the only other thing, I guess, would be to say you've got to avoid the unforced turnovers. I mean, giveaways is what they call it in hockey. And they were giving it away 2-1 to one to, to L.A. And they've got to stop the unforced turnovers. Because really, Lundqvist did everything he could, but he can't score for him, too. Mm -hmm. So, coming up game five, we're going back to the Staples Center. It's happening tomorrow. It's tomorrow. 8 o'clock. Back on NBC, right? We had the Sportsnet, NBC Sportsnet, but the flagship station is going to carry it out for the, uh, for the rest of it. Okay. Now, you've got another little uh, tidbit there where the general managers met. Yeah, yeah. I just thought I'd bring it up because we had talked about it right here on the Frat House Sports Show back in March when some of these rule changes were right. coming up uh, for, for consideration. And, and yesterday, uh, before the game began, the general managers got together and, and basically they granted support to the competition committee uh, on some of the changes that we might foresee next year. Uh, and if you're following you know, the playoffs, you'll, you'll understand some of these right off the bat. Uh, during the regular season next year, the proposal is to change the goalies from end to end, as we know now during the regular season. Uh, if you go to that extra five-minute overtime before the shootout, you stay in your original net. The proposition is 
Send them the other way, make it a little more playoff, switch it up. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, still keep that gimmick, though. There's no talk about getting rid of that. They how also want to take the trapezoid. How about you take the pads off? Yeah, well, I think, I think that's <laughs> what they want. Take the pads off. Take the, well, and the goalie should play with no mask. And not their, I think <laughs> exactly. That might, that, that maybe might, take the stick, too. That might take, take the stick, tie their hands behind their back, and make them eat pucks. Exactly. <laughs> uh, now, the trapezoid, which appears behind the net, they want to expand that. Now, this oh, is, come on. here's what's interesting about this. The trapezoid is known as the Brodeur zone anyway. They put it in because they were tired of guys like Brodeur scoring uh, on, on uh, empty nets. So they put the trapezoid in to stop that. Now they're talking, well, let's expand it a little. It's 18 feet now. Let's go to 22. I say, why don't we get rid of it? Thank you. All right. But there's that call. They're going to crack down on flopping. We know it as embellishment whoa, 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 in whoa. the NHL. Wait, wait. They well, run, this is an NBA play. thing. I know. Ron's I know. not in the NHL. NBA well, and MLS. Listen, it's, we call it flopping. Let's call it what it is. But they call it embellishment. They're now talking about changing the wording of the rule to include fines rather than just penalties. And they're even thinking maybe we'll go ahead and fine the coach if we have repeat offenders that continue to do this. They want to reconfigure That's the Tortorella rule. <laughs> we have maybe, yeah, right, exactly. We've got the Brodeur rule. Uh, they want to reconfigure the face-off circle. Now, if you're familiar with the face-off circle, you have the two hash marks that appear right, on right, the outside right, of the circle. Right. And, of course, uh, at the moment... On side, on side. Right. At the moment, the way it's set up, there's a three-and-a-half-foot distance. So, essentially, players line up on each other. They want to expand that to five so that there's less jostling and there will be a lot less chicanery and time wasted in the face-off. And maybe make a play. I'm just telling you what these are. Uh, talking about maybe a bench penalty of two minutes duration for getting tossed from the playoff, uh, from the face-off circle. Because that, too, <coughs> has been nothing but a, a waste of time, according to the competition committee. These guys jostle. They set up. Oh, he gets whistled. He gets thrown out. Bring this guy in. Now he jostles. Oh, the, the, kick the other guy out. Now somebody else comes and and finally, there's discussion of a uh, previously tabled notion of offering coach challenges. Are we talking about NFL here, people, or what? Well, baseball's got a sent Well, right, and we've seen how well that's worked. That's really, that hasn't, yeah, that's added no time to the game. At issue appear to be three particulars for this one. Questions on goals which occur having gone off the back netting and then come back into play what? and get scored. Yes, I'm just telling you. Oh, because that happens all the time. Right. Also, the penalties for shooting the puck up over the glass and you're called for delay again. Get rid of that penalty altogether and then you don't have to review it. I hear you. Believe me. And uh, the other would be, of course, offside. And to me, that okay, is a that challengeable, one. that is a legitimate challengeable. Where was it in what, 1980? Oh, dude, 83, <laughs> 84, 84, I believe. 84. Now, you know, the problem is a lot of these are judgment calls anyway. And if you're going to if you're going to start going there, now you're going to video review, and you're going to increase video review. And as I said about MLB, all it does, I think, is open up the situation to more unexpected consequences than it was designed to address. And let's get it straight. And the GMs are really split. The NHL has been praised as having one of the best review systems in all of major cities. They sit there in Toronto and watch every game. And they were ahead isn't of that, the curve. Right. Isn't that now. enough? Yeah. I mean, yep. I'm, I'm just wondering. You know, um, <clears throat> here's what. The Board of Governors and the, the Players Executive Board have to all convene and, and say it's good to go. Uh, the Board of uh, Governors are going to uh, meet uh, when on June 26th. The Executive Board is going to meet uh, middle of July, the 16th through the 19th. Now, on June 4, just before the Stanley Cup uh, final playoff, uh, Bettman did his uh, presser, and he said, and I quote, by any measure, this has been the most successful season in NHL history. And it's certainly hard to agree. The revenues are up, right? They were around $400 million when he took over in 93. They're up to $3.5 billion now. We've got Gretzky. He's been welcomed back with open arms. He's the ambassador. He's dropping ceremonial pucks in the Stanley Cup. And you've got basically the top two, you know, number one and two markets in the Stanley Cup final. So based on all that, before they make some of these changes that we've just addressed, I think they ought to think good and hard about where the payday is and not mess 
with too much more. Well, I, I have a rule change. I have one rule change. Since the NHL is taking rules from all these other leagues, yeah, right. we've, taken, we've taken the review from the NFL. We've taken flopping from the MLS and the NBA. Right. I think they should install safer barriers around the outside of the rink <laughs> to protect the players and then in, and bring NASCAR into this. I like the idea. I like the idea. Cut down on those checker flags. I think they should wave checker <laughs> flags when a goal is scored. <laughs> well, at any rate, we're going to see. We'll let you know. The when red this light's going to be replaced by a green light. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll let you know what happens as, All we, right, as we go through on. this summer. <laughs> <laughs> From the penalty box to the dugout, let's uh, get over to our baseball segment for the weekend. Uh, as always, that is brought to you by our friends Carl and Jim over at CLW83. All right, CLW83.com. Many, many thanks uh, to those guys over there for uh, helping us out every week. Uh, and do me a favor, make sure you get over to Jim's Touch Em All Facebook page. Give that a like over there, and then you're going to get all the updates from him on when they do their podcasts and their shows and all that kind of stuff. It's a one-stop shopping mm -hmm. for his program over there. Touch them all and give them a like on Facebook. All right. Uh, let's get to this week's grouping of screw stories. Huh? It's time again for right. Frat House Mike's Screwball Stories. All righty. Well, it was just a few weeks ago uh, that we sat awaiting the name of uh, Johnny Manziel to get called in the NFL draft. Uh, when it finally happened in earnest late in the uh, late in the first round by the Cleveland Browns. Well, how about this one? Last Saturday, the San Diego Padres made Johnny football Johnny baseball as they drafted him in the 28th round, the 837th overall pick in the Major League Baseball draft. You're Douche going back. Johnny. That's Mr. Irrelevant, I hope, in, in MLB. Actually, right? Is that MLB? Probably more. There were probably more there after the fact. But make no mistake, he is Mr. Irrelevant oh, in boy. baseball. Oh, yeah, boy. Manziel had visited with the Padres in May and took a little BP uh, and had some throwing exercises. Uh, and Well, he did play a bit of baseball in high school. Yeah, right. Uh, it is generally <laughs> thought, however, that the Padres were simply orchestrating a bit of PR fun. Uh, with the pick, and uh, that Manziel will never There's something ever play here. a single game ever. in a major league uniform. Uh, at least, let's hope not. <clears throat> well, from the looks of that picture, he also plays catcher. Oh, no. Uh oh. No, dang. No. Sorry. Had to All do right. it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the next uh, this story is really less screwy than it is amazing and maybe even a bit commendable. This is wild, this one here. Third yeah. baseman Lonnie uh, Chesenhall uh, has been on and off the Cleveland Indians roster for the past three seasons. While considered one of the team's uh, biggest prospects, uh, it hasn't exactly materialized to everyone's satisfaction, both the team and Chesenhall's. That is, until recently. Monday night, uh, in a game against the Texas Rangers, Chisholm Hall went 5-for-5 five five with, are we ready, three home runs and nine RBIs as the Indians won the game 17-7. to seven. Wow. He had an RBI single in the first inning, two run homers in the second and fourth inning, an RBI double in the sixth, and a three-run blast in the eighth. Uh, he's just the fourth player since 1920 to amass five hits, three home runs, and nine RBIs in one game. And the first since Fred Lynn did it with the Red Sox on June 18, 1975. Chisholm Hall is the first player since 1920 to do it, though, while going 5-4-5. Five five. Right. I mean, 95 years almost. Kid's wow. 25 years old. He's not a kid. He's 25 years old. He has struggled to really get a, 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 a regular spot and play every day on a major league roster. Right now, he's hitting 393 with a 619 slugging percentage. He's got seven home runs and 32 RBIs in 53 games played. And better and than you that... you say steroids? Oh, uh, come on, man. Better than that, he's trending on Twitter. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's not go throwing the steroid claim out there. That's, that's oh, not fair on. to the kids. We, we have a guy who who struggles to make squads, 
is not hitting well, and then all of a sudden he's got a really good year. Well, let's let's just saying. Let's no, I, listen. I don't want Fred House Sports being the one that puts that kind of a claim out there. That's just not right. We don't have any evidence of that, and that's let's let's just oh, let's, it, let's it, thank the kid and, and, and pat him on the back for doing a great job. That's wonderful. Let's hope it's not that. I would certainly but, hope it's not that. But if it does come out, we can go back to this episode and say, hey, we told you. We'll mark the tape. <laughs> you told them. Atta boy. Atta boy. All right. What do you make of this one? Hey, with a 25 and 42 record and 42 and 14 games out of first place, the Tampa Bay Rays right now are currently the worst team in baseball at 373. That's the Tampa Bay Rays. Weren't we talking about them just a couple of weeks ago, I like being thought, in second place? Yeah, you're right. Then we weren't drinking. Mm-hmm. I don't think we were drunk, were we, at no. the time? I think we were. Well, right? Stay right? thirsty, my friend. I know you weren't. No. Um, well, listen, at their wits, <laughs> manager Joe Madden, uh, well, what he did was he invited 77-year-old Seminole tri- le- tribe leader uh, and medicine man Bobby Henry into the Tropicana field uh, to spin his magic on the field. And uh, I don't know, I guess maybe what he was hoping was he was going to come in and, like, do a dance or something. Well, 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 more than the Eagles. More than the Yeah, really. I can't do that. Um, <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> we just turned <laughs> For the Braves in town? <laughs> uh, <laughs> we just turned the voice on the trap, Madden said. If it rains in the trap, I'll be really impressed. That will be his best moment ever. All right. Uh, well, listen, uh, the uh, medicine man's uh, visit at all, well, it, it hasn't helped. Um, I've got just one question. Uh, well, actually, i got a couple. Yeah. First of all, is this politically correct? Uh, and second, did the Native American tribes approve of uh, this obvious exploitation and mockery of their culture? How about that? We'll leave that one for sidekick first. Oh, no. I, I have a second thought, but <laughs> not about that. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Since, since, since the Madison Man, mm-hmm. they're one and two, but it did start raining at the beginning of the game after his visit. That's right. Outside. Not That's inside correct. stadium. Not inside. But outside right. stadium. Not inside. You know, my thing is, yeah. look, they've tried, they've tried all kinds of stuff. To, like, get this team going in the past, right, from what I've read. Yeah. They've tried a python. Yeah. They've tried penguins, right? they tried a magician. Listen, just give it up, man. And you can't get it up. Try Levitra. I see it all the time. Viagra. <laughs> so let it be written. So let it be done. That's all I'm saying. Might want to check their wood. That's all I'm saying. Screwy stories. <laughs> Let's go take a look at the yeah, NL standings after uh, this past week. The Blue Jays still leading in the East by four and a half games over the Orioles. Tigers right now two games in front of the Royals. The Royals. Yes, Royals. That's your place. Kansas City team. And uh, it, down in the West, uh, the A's right now three and a half games in front of the Angels. How about this one, though? Before we get out of the uh, American League, Houston Astros right now have a better record than the Tampa Bay Rays and the Boston Red Sox. Wow. Both Yeah, Sox. Mm-hmm. That's the wow. Houston Astros, folks, that, that I just wow. mentioned. All right. Over in the NL, the Washington Nationals right now momentarily took over the East uh, one game in front of the, the Braves. They did that just yesterday. The Brewers right now are five in front of the Cardinals. Giants seven and a half in front of the Dodgers. That's where we stand in Major League Baseball. And again, many, many thanks to uh, CLW83.com. Get out over there and check out all of their programming. Many thanks, Jim and Carl. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's roll on over to our motorsports report. And that is brought to you by our friends. Herb FM Sports Radio and Chris down there in Baltimore. And I mentioned it last week. I'm going to mention it again. You do not want to miss Herb FM live broadcast of the American Indoor Football Baltimore Mariners this Saturday. This Saturday, that's June 14th, 7.30 p.m., HerbFM.com. Mariners rate will be playing for the championship against the Cape Fear Heroes, from, uh, and that game will be coming to you from Fayetteville, North Carolina. All right, cool. good luck to the guys down there at Herb FM. Good luck to the Baltimore Mariners. Uh, and many thanks to all the folks down in Baltimore that listen to us regularly over on Herb FM. We thank you very much. All right, uh, NASCAR, let's take a look at it. We traveled to the mountains 
uh, this past Sunday for the uh, our 14th race of the season. Tricky triangle of uh, Pocono Raceway. And look at here. It was Junior uh, <laughs> with his second win mm -hmm. of the season. Kind of sneaking in there a little bit right at the end to get that checkered it. flag. Yes, he did. Um, and as you just mentioned, others who came in the top five, Brad Kozlowski yeah. came in second. Now, that was his second second place finish in a row. Plus, 95 laps led the most right. of anybody. I mean, he was out front, it yep. seemed like, the whole o Almost day. the whole race, yep. exactly. Kirk Busch came in third. Denny Hamlin came in fourth. Denny, we said, runs well here. Mm -hmm. How about rookie? Kyle Larson nice. coming in fifth. You know, I'm loving him. I am I so loving him. I, I think he's my new uh, favorite hero. There you go. Honestly, I think he is. Now, take a look at this. Three of the top fives that won the race were our one, two, three in pole position. All right? Uh, but I, as you pointed out, I've highlighted Brad Kozlowski uh, for this week. Uh, as I mentioned, 95 laps led. Second, second place finish in a, in a row. Currently right now sitting sixth on our leaderboard. Mm -hmm. Uh, probably would be higher if he had the two wins. He's right. only got the one win, right. but uh, fifth in points. Fifth in points, so he would actually be up a little bit higher if he had two wins. The other I've highlighted, Casey Kane. We haven't mentioned him much at all this past season. Uh, really had a very, very good run at Pocono this past weekend. Uh, that is until about lap 144. Uh, ended his day when he hit the wall. That ended his day. Ended up in 42nd. Apparently, uh, Kane uh, dropping a lot of blame for that one on mm -hmm. uh, Kyle Busch. Mm -hmm. Kyle kept mum, of course. Yeah. But let's take a look at the leaderboard. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> let's take a look at the leaderboard where it stands right now. And there goes, whoop, that Dale Jr. Junior dropped all the way up to the top. All right. Nice. Jimmy nice. Johnson. But no, notice the points. Only one point separating Jimmy, Jimmy Johnson and, yeah, and, yeah. and Dale. Uh, uh, Logano is still up there. Of course, all of our two winners right yeah, there. Yeah, I was going to say, you're starting to see the cream rise there. Exactly. All right. Uh, <clears throat> this weekend, uh, we're heading out to Michigan International Speedway. God, I like this track. I really like MIS. Uh, coverage begins 1 p.m. Eastern time on TNT. Uh, what we, I, I kept track of it. I, I think we had like six or seven KFC commercial sidekick. Just wanted to point that out. Um, historically now, I have fielded pretty good teams at MIS. I like MIS. I do well fantasy-wise here. Okay. But sidekick, uh, I nonetheless, I could still use him. Well, you don't listen to me anyway. Uh -huh. no, <laughs> Only for three years. Yeah, but I, I write them down. I write them down. I write them down. <laughs> well, Mike, Mike was only good the first season we started this. Oh, That's what he listened. You're not nice. Then he, then he thought he, you know, he was. I got he was this. A, hey, I he got this. Genius. He I, thought he was a NASCAR guru. And for it. the last couple seasons, he hasn't been listening to me, and he's been at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, I wrote them down for good Well, then, for the rest of our fans. <laughs> yeah, for the rest of our fans. Right. <laughs> for everybody except for Fred House. Yeah, exactly, right. Um, all right. So Here we're we go. MIS uh, this weekend. Actually, you know, uh, weirdly enough, MIS, since the repave, has, is one of the fastest tracks on the circuit. They're, they average speeds faster than Talladega. Wow. So, okay. And it's only a two mile oval. A lot higher banking. It's similarly yeah, configured to uh, yeah. Fontana. So, uh, anyway, drivers. So, we're going to go with Dale Jr. Uh, mm -hmm. He's 27-25. Uh, you know, momentum, momentum, momentum here. Uh, he's a two-time winner at MIS. Uh, he's got two wins. He won last week in Pocono. Runs real well here. We could see him be the first three-time winner of the season. Okay. Um. Then we're going to go with uh, Mike's Mike's favorite, uh, Mr. Mum, Kyle Busch, oh, okay. 2650. Uh, he won at Fontana earlier this season, um, and he's got previous wins at MIS, mm -hmm. and usually usually runs fairly well uh, here, getting top fives in that. So you know we don't necessarily need wins. Um, we just need them to you know run up front. Get some laps led, mm -hmm. you know, quality passes, stuff like that, you know, because we're dealing with points uh, in in fantasy. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, then we're going to go with Brad Keselowski, twenty six twenty five. Uh, Penske, as you know, has been on fire at the two mile ovals this season, um, and he could very well get his second uh, win of the season. Mm -hmm. 
Then we're going to go to the fill the roster guys. And we're going to put... Juan Pablo Montoya on yeah, it. He's back. This is his first Did time, you, right? Wait, who? He's wait, running wait. for, is it Team Penske? Who's he driving, he's, right? Team he's Penske running the number 12, uh, okay, third number 12 car for Penske. Penske. You're in, in this is his, car, his is second? It? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was this his first? First? Right? Yeah, I thought, yeah, I thought this was. Later. Okay, right. I thought right. this was his first time. Okay, so Juan Pablo. Cool. Yep, okay. so, and and like I, like I said with Brad Keselowski, all the Penske's have run really well. Uh, the two mile ovals. So, you know, I expect Juan Pablo to hopefully not hit any jet dryers. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think I. You he's going to take out a Titan this year. Yeah, change it up. <laughs> so, you know, and he's only, you know, he's 10 bucks. So, you know, you got, you know, you got a pretty decent driver That's not bad, in yeah. a, you know, probably pretty decent, decent board, mm-hmm. uh, you know, at a good value. So why not put him on your roster this week? And then uh, the lucky dog, uh, we're going to go with Landon Castle, 775. You know, he's, 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 you, know, he's the new, you know, the new low-end guy with, you know, the, you know, the best value guy. So. Mm-hmm. All right. And nice. that's the picks. There you have it. Let's go take a look at the Fred House Sports Fantasy Leaderboard. And again, uh, constantly. Our fantasy team up at the top. Sidekick nice. spoilers. Nice. Team Blood Pack, you move back up into third. Uh, somehow or another, I'm still on the board. I don't know how it's possible. I'm still down there in ninth. Uh, let's see. Our buddy Greg uh, maintained his position there in second. Yep. And, uh, well, you moved up and took over Nicole's spot there at third. So, all right. But that's, that's where it stands right now. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll see where it stands again next week at this time. All right. There's our race report for this week brought to you by... Herb FM Sports Radio, and again, do not forget about that live broadcast coming to you Saturday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Easy to get to, HerbFM.com. You can listen to the Baltimore Mariners beat up on the Cape Fear Heroes and win the AIF Championship. All right, make sure you do that. Cool. All right, we're going to wrap it up, but we got a couple of things we're going to want to leave everybody else with. NBA. Um... Game four of the NBA Finals is this evening with San Antonio Spurs currently leading two games to one. Tuesday night, incredible, incredible performance by the Spurs uh, as they, they beat up on the, the Heat in Miami. Had a, 71 points in the first half alone. All right. Uh, and so right now, as it stands, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of going to chalk. But if the Spurs were to win tonight, that's going to put them substantially ahead of the uh, Heat. All right. Over in uh, MMA, real quick, uh, sidekick, I wanted to get your, your read on this one. Interesting story here that came down the other day when it was announced that uh, Shale Sonnen had failed another uh, random drug test uh, and as a result will not be eligible to participate in UFC 175 on July 5th. The card got changed up a bit from the way it looks. Uh, so give us your read on this. If I'm not mistaken, isn't this Sonnen's third time getting nailed? Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure how many times he's got caught now. Um, this kind of isn't a story anymore uh, because, yeah. he, as I point out, he just announced his retirement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I asked you whether you thought that that was wow. as a result thereof. Or I, yeah. mean, I mean, poof. Yeah, poof. Right. We just poof. We well, it, you know, <laughs> th- th- there's going to be those people out there who are going to say, you know, casually looking at it, saying, "Well, well you know, he got caught. He's going to leave. He's going to, you know, he's retiring. He's trying to get out. He's going to come back after, you know, in another year or stuff like that." You got to, you got to remember, Ch- Chael is 37 years old. Right. Okay. Um, in MMA, well, I. I guess to go in a little history, in March, the the Nevada uh, Sports Association banned testosterone. Um, fighters were able to file for a license if they, you know, if a doctor diagnosed them with low T, they were allowed to be on a on a uh, uh, testosterone replacement therapy. So in March, they went. They had a meeting. They said, look, we're banning it out right now. You can't have it. Now, out of 500 fighters in the UFC, only five fighters had license for TRT. 
Okay. What happened was, as part of coming off of the program, Shale's doctors uh, gave him a, gave him prescriptions for estrogen uh, medication. So that's what he actually popped for on that test. And you know, basically, what he said was, you know, he's trying to trying to have a family, trying to get his wife pregnant, you know. And family's more important. So instead of him continually coming up hot, he's just going to go and retire and be a dad. Would it surprise you if all of a sudden he showed back up again later on? You know, that's the thing with these guys. You know, it, it's kind of like, you know, the Bet- Brett Favre syndrome, where, you know, you have a guy that, you know, retires, comes back, retires, comes back. You know, it's kind of in their DNA. You know what I mean? And, you know, they always want to come back to for one more fight. At least one to speculate whether he's just trying to skirt it yeah. all. That's I don't know. I, uh, all right, I, now we've talked I, about I, it. Time will tell. I, I don't think he's necessarily going to come back. We've talked about Saudi numerous times here. So when I read the story, so, I posted it up on our Facebook page. Yeah. And I thought, wow, this is interesting. This guy's been nailed twice before. And, you know, yeah. now you're telling me he's retiring. Uh, I'm just kind of sitting there with, a, you know, my eyebrow goes up. Uh, well, here's here's something real interesting, real quick though, about Shale. Dana White last week actually uh, endorsed him to take over his position with the UFC. If you know, when it gets to a point where he's gonna, where uh, Dana okay. White would step away, right? He was saying that Shale would make a great replacement for him, right? So, plus Shale's also a commentator for Fox. Yes. For doing for doing UFC fights, I've so it's not like he doesn't have bad. other things going. He's actually not so. too bad as a commentator. No, I mean he's a great character. A lot of guys hate him. A lot of guys hate him because he's got this like WWE, you know, persona persona with him, and that sells <laughs> fights. I'm sorry, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you do what you do to sell fights. Right. He sells fights. He's not real good at fighting. He's lost a batch of his last fights. Even though he's been on this TRT program, so you can't say you know, it, you know, you can't really argue that you know he's having impressive knockouts or anything like that. He's losing his fights, mm-hmm. so you know it's not like you know he's dominating people. Gotcha. And that, but you know, I personally kind of like a little bit of you know, uh, Rick, you know, Richard Sherman, you know, some some you know some you know cojones, you know. Gotcha. All right, well, I just mentioned uh, our Facebook page that I posted up there, and let's finish it off this way. We're going to go to our Facebook post of of the week, Frat House Sports Facebook post of the week. 20 years ago today, uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman were found murdered. Um, And as we know, this led to the sports media changing O.J. Simpson trial. Well, I posted up a story just yesterday about a new investigation uh, that has been released by a private investigator who has written a book on his findings reporting that O.J. did not commit the crime, but knew uh, that it was his emotionally disturbed son, Jason, who was actually responsible and apparently provides a, a substantial amount of circumstantial kind of evidence mm-hmm. in the book. Interesting. It is a fascinating, yep. fascinating article. Yep. And uh, you must read it. And in order to find it, you got to go to our Facebook page, Frat House Sports. Give us a like. You'll find the post. Hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. I mean, like four or five hundred people have checked in to this particular post to check this story out. It is positively fascinating. Um, so get over there and like our page for that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff we bring you. All right. Every there we go. day. There we go. And we brought you a packed, packed program here with a lot of stuff, a lot of action in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we'll be doing it again next week, as we always do. Don't forget our Frat House Sports Facebook page. You can always catch up to us there, fratthousesports.net. All right. Oh, no more finger? I took it down on purpose. I got tired of you bringing it up. (laughs) Not a finger! Not a finger! Not a finger! Uh, All right, there you go. There you have it. Uh, One more thing you got to do for us. You got to keep us real. You got to keep us live. You gotta keep us going. We'll yeah, see you but next we're week. Talk, yeah, but we're talking money versus popularity among adults. So. Popularity, so. exactly, my friend. I'm gonna tell you something right now. There are still going to be, there's still gonna be a hell of a. Uh, listen, I am more inclined. If I had the wherewithal, I am more inclined 
to pay for a Pacquiao fight than ever pay for a UFC fight. I have no interest in it whatsoever. None. How about a soccer well, fight? Would you pay for a soccer fight? You might see one of those in Brazil. A, I want to see. A sidekicks fight, then what you want. I don't want to see that, but. <laughs> what if he wins? You're going oh, to yeah. see a soccer fight. Are we me. going to see a soccer fight? <clears throat> Is it going to be two soccer moms? No. Fighting over a party. In jello. We got to hope we got in jello, for God's sake. <laughs> in jello. Nice.